we have with us Dr. Iberi Anakwa, who is an associate professor in the Department of Pharmaceutical Health Services Research at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. And she is also executive director of the Pharmaceutical Research Computing Center at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. We also have with us Dr. Avi Abernathy. She is the president of the clinical research business at Verily, an Alphabet Inc. or Google company. Uh, most recently, until just a, you know, just a, a month or two ago, she was a principal deputy commissioner and acting chief information officer of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. She was involved in uh, many critical efforts at the FDA, including overseeing real-world evidence data um, and si systems and guidelines. So she's going to talk about that experience, but also looking forward. I would like to thank Dr. Abernathy, particularly she's on family vacation right now and uh, she's taking time away to come talk with us. But we're gonna to go to uh, Dr. Anakwa Iberi uh, first and uh, turn it, I'll turn it over to you right now. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here today and to be part of this program focused on real world data and real world evidence. As Chris mentioned, uh, in my role with the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, I direct a computing center and much of our work day to day focuses on working with these real world data sets. And so I'm very pleased to be able to share uh, a bit of uh, some thoughts with you. You've heard from many experts throughout the program to date about the uses of real world data and some caveats as well. I'll be discussing the use of these data sets as it applies to examining subgroups and what the implications that are then for sources of data that uh, we might use. I will also uh, pull from the literature to show what uh, already has been done around linking these different data sets. So we think about the average, particularly in statistics, as a way to generally characterize a population and do so efficiently. Uh, many times that number is informative. There are times when it is less informative and may even be misleading. And so let's consider one example. This is a graph from a report put out by the Commonwealth Fund. And in this particular graph, they are uh, providing data for uh, 10 countries where they surveyed adults to identify who cited cost as a reason for skipping prescriptions or having filled a prescription, skipping doses of those prescriptions. And so if we look along the x-axis here on the left-hand side from uh, the United Kingdom data over to the data for Canada, we see this proportion of individuals ranging from two to 10%. And in this sample of 10 countries, we have the US as an outlier, where you see that the number for those who are insured in the US is 14%, and more than double that for those who are uninsured. So we have a third of uninsured individuals uh, citing cost as a reason for skipping prescriptions or having filled those prescriptions, skipping doses. So in this particular scenario with these uh, country level data, we see that had we calculated an average, it wouldn't necessarily represent the US very well, uh, particularly those who were uninsured in the US. Now we can think about uh, country level data or we can think about groups based on individual characteristics. So let's go to a couple more examples of that, uh, keeping the focus on cost as a reason for not utilizing. We can think about cost-related non-utilization in two different ways, where individuals who need to see a doctor do not because of cost. That's one dimension of cost-related non-utilization. You can also think about individuals who do not take the medication as it was prescribed, again, because of cost. And so when we consider these two aspects of cost-related non-utilization, here we examined it using data made available by the CDC. And on the left-hand side here, you can see that 12.7% of the respondents reported cost-related non-utilization as it applies to not seeing a doctor that they needed to see because of cost. 
And then on the right-hand side, you can see that 7.4% of respondents reported cost-related non-utilization, focusing on not using medications as prescribed because of cost. That's all well and good to have that average value. But now let's consider what that looks like among a particular subgroup where we're dividing up based on race ethnicity. So here we have uh, the same proportion of cost-related non-utilization reported for whites, blacks, and our Latinx subgroup. And you can see above average proportions for our black and Latinx groups for both of these measures. 18.5% reporting cost-related non-utilization compared to 12.7 for the average value. And then 25.7% among our Latinx subgroup reporting cost-related non-utilization compared to the 12.7% we saw for the full sample. And a similar pattern emerges when you consider cost-related non-utilization due to prescription meds. So here's one clear advantage of having a larger sample size, which is what these data sets offer, is with these larger sample sizes, we're able to consider subgroups based on race and ethnicity, age, we could look at other demographic characteristics. We can even look at groupings determined by where individuals live, rural, urban. And so that is a strength of the data that's been leveraged by many researchers and will continue to be leveraged by many researchers. The question one starts to ask, particularly when you look at results that provide evidence of differential burden, whether that's differential clinical burden or differential economic burden, what next? What do we do with these data? How do we then leverage these findings? Beyond identifying differences, what can be done about them? And that's where I would say appropriate interpretation of group differences becomes critical that we need this contextual specificity. This is a term that was discussed in Pench uh, et al's recent paper within the context of algorithmic bias and how it applies to artificial intelligence models used for developing prediction models. But whether you're using your data to uh, inform prediction models or in the setting where I work to develop explanatory models, hypothesis testing models, that contextual specificity is still critical, where you want to understand how these health systems that are engaging providers and patients and different entities and groups, how they differ in design, how they differ in objectives, how they differ in the individuals whom they serve, who are coming from different environments, different cultures, different preferences, lifestyles, socioeconomic status, um, can differ and does differ, genetic endowments do differ. How can we take that context and represent it in our data? Well, we first have to understand what that context is. And that's where engagement of stakeholders becomes really important to understand what that looks like in a giving setting. In statistics and modeling, we talk about truly understanding the data generating process behind uh, the data sets that you're utilizing. But this means the behavior that guides healthcare utilization, what does that look like in the population? For the providers, what does that look like when they're engaging with patients? Then you wanna consider what is available to me as a researcher, uh, or someone who's producing this evidence. What are the data sets that are available? What are the measures to really mirror this context in my data if possible? And then what are the methods by that I mean, the statistical methods that are available for then conducting the analysis and the way that carries that contextual specificity through the data, through the measures to your analysis and your interpretation. And to that end, there's a lot that is already being done with the real world data. We have really innovative record linkages that are already occurring. And by record linkage, I mean joining data from multiple sources using a common identifier. Sometimes that identifier is the medical record number or a payer generated identifier that carries through with the patient across different data sources. But the goal is then to create that context in which healthcare uh, utilization occurs by considering the individual, 
who's seeking and, uh, and accessing healthcare, the providers they're interfacing with, the healthcare system in which they're operating, the geographic environment that they're navigating to, uh, to seek that care and to receive that care. And there are plenty of examples that uh, can be provided for how these record linkages are occurring. And I'll give just a few from uh, published work that you can think about the individual in the context of the county in which they live, where with the individual level data, you have access to demographic information, clinical information, all of that to help understand who receives treatment is one example of a study outcome that one might be interested in and who doesn't. But you also might wanna think about where they live and how that either facilitates or complicates their efforts to receive treatment so that you have uh, a more holistic picture of that eventual treatment decision um, by considering the county level characteristics. And there are data sets available that provide for all the counties uh, that are represented information about uh, housing characteristics, uh, the indoor living environment, the outdoor living environment, the availability of healthcare services and personnel, all of that to, to really try to recreate the context uh, in which individuals move to receive services. Another example we can think about is uh, considering the individual within a hospital in which they might have received care. So if you're, uh, as we had done in this study, interested in readmissions uh, following an initial admission, that you're considering, of course, the individual characteristics, the comorbidity profile, um, other aspects of the individual that would be important for understanding the readmission risk, but also understanding their experience in the hospital uh, during that initial stay. Uh, what was that experience like? What was the quality of care they received? What are some other characteristics of the hospital that uh, would then impact for a given individual uh, their experience during that stay and then subsequent outcomes like a readmission? And then lastly, another kind of linkage one might consider, although this is not at all uh, a comprehensive list, is to think about individuals uh, and their provider as a cluster, where we are able with the individual level data to link to physician level data via uh, the national provider ID uh, to understand the characteristics of providers and how that might uh, help us to better understand individual treatment outcomes. And then closing, just to uh, summarize some of the points is that one of the beauties and strengths with the real world data and particularly the large sample sizes that they offer is that we can identify subgroup differences uh, for various types of uh, intermediate process outcomes as well as health outcomes. We then want to be uh, clear that we are interpreting those differences uh, with appropriate attention to the context in which the healthcare utilization occurred. And there are many frameworks that are multi-level in nature. And by that, I mean, uh, considering not just the individual, but uh, the structure around them, such as the providers that they interact with, the hospitals they interact with, the geographic area in which they live. And then there are also multiple dimensions to consider where we're thinking about health behavior, we're thinking about the built environment, and what that means for the individual's uh, eventual decision. So these frameworks abound. Uh, I would say that the data has not quite caught up with these frameworks, but we are uh, looking in those directions, which is promising, uh, that they are already innovative linkages that are happening with data where we're seeking to recreate and be able to test these frameworks and conduct research that is guided as well by these frameworks. Uh, all of this then will push us and challenge us to identify new sources of data for these linkages, all again, so that we are able to talk uh, in a nuanced and appropriate fashion about subgroup differences that we might find with the data. With that, I will close and turn it back over to Chris. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, I, have, I have some questions for you, but we, we're gonna hear from Dr. Amy Abernathy first. Um, Dr. Uh, Abernathy was at the FDA overseeing the real world evidence analytical uh, 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 issue 
Um, she is now at Verily, which is part of Google slash Alphabet Inc., a, you know, a, a tech company, an innovative tech company. So I was hoping uh, kind of parting words for the day, you could give us a sense of where this, where this discussion about the use of real world evidence might be going. And then we'll hear from her for uh, 10 or so minutes and then we'll have time for a few final questions. Terrific, Chris. Thank you very much for allowing me to uh, bring this conversation home about the future of real world data. And in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to make five key points, um, but building from what we've just discussed. Um, the first is that I think the future moves towards a landscape of totality of the evidence. The second is that it is about the data. The third is the impact of the tech industry, including software, hardware, data tech on this space. The fourth is that um, it's very dynamic right now with changing goalposts. And that mean, leads to the fifth, which is that we do have a building corpus of knowledge or science, but we're gonna need to continue to build the science and build the muscle around how do we leverage rural data and totality of the evidence to make sense of what works for whom and when. So first on, on that agenda, what I think we're starting to see within the context of the real world data and real world evidence space is a movement towards thinking about all of the information, the totality of the evidence that drive both from traditional clinical trials, pragmatic clinical trials, and also analyses of pass passively collected data in order to understand what works and for whom and when. Um, if in an FDA context, you see this showing up right now in the devices center, CDRH, who's looking towards totality of the evidence and continuous life cycle evaluation of devices, diagnostics, and medical pro products across the landscape of how they work. And I think that this is going to require of us to think about real world data and real world evidence in the context of what else this can tell us when we pair it with clinical trials data. You're also seeing, for example, real world data and real world evidence help us design better clinical trials, informing the populations to be studied, the endpoints and how they're going to perform, or longitudinal evaluation. So that's one of the important directions in this real world data and real world evidence space. Now, if we drill in a bit and focus specifically on the real world evidence part of, of the story and, and, and how that gets generated, I think you've been hearing all day that real world evidence is essentially the knowledge derived from or generated from the underlying data. And I think that the story here going to the future is that it's gonna be about the data. Just as you heard, as we have better data sets, contextual specificity, understanding the data generating process, this is going to help us have more confidence in the reliability of the information generated by real world data as we change it into real world evidence. And so I think that one of the things that you're gonna see going forward is an incredible focus on improving the data sets in a number of ways, as I'll get into in a second, in order to then have more reliable information that can be used to make really critical decisions, including regulatory decisions. So what do I mean it's about the data? Well, you've been hearing about different types of potential real world data that could be leveraged for real world evidence. Electronic health record data, data from passive sensors, such as the accelerometer in your watch, information from medical claims, maybe even information from environmental health or environmental data sets, socioeconomic data, et cetera. And this is all going to start to become more and more available and leveraged within the context of real world data and real world evidence. But in order for that to happen, we're gonna to need to deal with some of the inherent challenges in real world data derived, especially from these passively collected contexts. First of all, for example, think about physician notes. Not only is there the physician scrawl, and I admit my, my handwriting is terrible, but in fact, to be able to leverage even that which is in the PDF, which is essentially digital paper and turn that into consistent, reliable structured data. We're gonna to have to have data curation practices that take place at scale. And so you're seeing some companies work on data curation, such as the company I used to work for, um, Flatiron Health is one example that's really focused um, on the curation of what we would call unstructured documents in the electronic health record to, to generate real world data sets. You're gonna see more and more companies start to work on, for example, data linkage, as you just heard about, tokenization, 
You're going to also see companies start to work on improving the quality of the data in other ways, such as creating standardized variables using, for example, um, data that's coming out of sensors um, in your watch. And so the data types that are becoming available are voluminous and the quality is going to improve and the reliability of the data as we start to do work in cleaning up the data and making it more available for the analysis that we need. You're also gonna see um, going forward, leveraging more sophisticated technology on the analysis side. The problem though is we can't leverage artificial intelligence easily, for example, until the data sets improve and we understand the bias in data sets. And so practically speaking, this isn't a black box, push a button and aha, we get the answer kind of world, but rather thoughtful, consistent movement towards using data sets to be able to leverage basic statistics or more advanced statistics and subsequently advanced analyses, including artificial intelligence in the future. Why do I then think that it's gonna be very important for health tech to be at the, at the table in this space going forward? It's because I think health tech trying to generate better data sets and using an analyses to create reliable information in the future should not be happening in a vacuum. We need health tech companies to bring the best of software and hardware and what's possible to the table, but we need health tech companies working together with academics, with researchers and pharmaceutical manufacturers and others who really understand the products, with qualitative scientists who understand the context, with regulators, we need all of that to come together. And I submit to you that the future is not gonna just be any one group, but it's gonna be all of these groups coming together to build the solution set for the future. And that's gonna be critical. What do I think then the future looks like? I think that you're gonna see more health tech at the, at the table. I think that you're gonna see a future where teams are building the science together. We saw this take place in the context of COVID. I think it's gonna be important that regulators are at the table because in fact, regulators also need to learn along with the groups what's possible. And I think what you're gonna see is that this is gonna be dynamic. The data sets are gonna continuously improve. The analytic capabilities are gonna continuously improve. The ability to combine real world data analyses with clinical trial analyses are gonna continuously improve. And so our definition of what is good look like is gonna continuously evolve. Finally, um, Chris, you asked me uh, yesterday when we were um, talking about why did I join Verily? When I was at FDA, one of the things that I could see is that one of the, co co the choke points in the context of addressing the pandemic was evidence generation. Our discovery engines are working incredibly. Look at the mRNA vaccines. We worked at the FDA on how do we scale our regulatory apparatus so we can review more applications, et cetera. But our evidence generation still is circa 1995, especially on the clinical trials plus verbal data side. And so I really left FDA to work on that problem and joined Verily where what we're doing is thinking about how do we marry decentralized clinical trial solutions, traditional clinical trial solutions and real world evidence solutions in order to generate the kind of data sets that are gonna be able to take us into the future from an evidence generation standpoint. With that, I'll turn it back over to you, Chris, and look forward to answering questions. Okay, so we just have, we have 10 or so minutes for questions. If uh, any of you out there have a question, raise your Zoom hand or put it into the Q&A function. Um, Barry, I'd like to go to you uh, to talk a little bit more about subgroup differences. I mean, the, the example that you showed us had a pretty massive subgroup difference between whites, uh, African-Americans and Hispanics um, from like 12% to 25%. So my question is, can, randomized control trials ever really get at those kind of subgroup differences? Um, or is it going to be really become necessary to use real world evidence to, to, to get at those? I think that there is a role for uh, trial data with regards to subgroups, an important role, because the strong design of the clinical trial is not reproducible uh, in most part unless you're in that experimental trial setting. And that is not the setting in which real world data are generated. And so even now there's a strong push, I think building on what's been a historical interest in seeing increased diversity in clinical trials uh, in participants uh, of these trials. 
for the express purpose of being able to examine heterogeneity in the effectiveness or efficacy of treatments. So that is important. Um, but the real world data are different. They are generated in the context of clinical practice. When you're talking, for example, about claims data, um, they are also survey sets. So there are different sources of these data sets. But the goal is that uh, it is not an experimental setting. It's individuals transacting or not <laughs> with a system. Uh, and these are typically large samples. So they lend themselves very nicely to be able to look at subgroups uh, as opposed to a trial setting where that's going to be more of a, uh, of a purposeful effort uh, to achieve that diversity and be able to examine subgroups there too. Okay. Um, Amy, I'd like to ask you kind of a similar question. In the context of FDA approvals, usually a, a drug or device is approved um, based on clinical trials of adults, um, and, it, and it doesn't, you know, uh, it doesn't deal with, with those under 18. It often doesn't deal with um, people who are like who are older. Um, if real world evidence were to be employed more, would it be possible that you know devices and, and drugs could be approved for for a much broader population than they kind of are right now in their initial approval? Great question. Um, so in fact, in 21st century cures, we saw that one of the specific uh, settings or use cases of that that piece of legislation asked the FDA to specifically look at was the use of real world data and evidence for secondary indications. So for example, a drug that's improved in one setting such as adults and now is being utilized after it's now approved to be on market in other settings such as the pediatric setting. And so um, in fact, I, I think one of the compelling settings there, that there may be a role for real world data and real world evidence is this so-called label expansion to different populations um, and understanding performance in, in subpopulations. I submit to you though, that in order for that to happen, we need the data sets, right? So for example, um, unless there is use of the medication in the pediatric setting and then systematic observation either in a registry or electronic health record data that's now being captured and curated or cleaned up, then the ability to leverage real world data isn't there because the data sets don't exist. And, and so importantly, we need the data sets to exist. And then the third part is we still need to know how to analyze those data sets. So how do we come to confident um, decisions because the analyses make sense? And there's a lot of work being done right now in how to do these types of analyses, for example, for in, in this secondary indication space. And we've seen some of that happening in cancer right now. Okay. So uh, Barry, you were talking about um, uh, claims data and, and linking to claims data for real world evidence, the real world data collection. I'm wondering, is it, is it, is it easier to do real world evidence based um, studies in countries like the UK that have a national health system compared with the US that has this very fragmented health system. I mean, with all these different, all these different insurers and public and private payers, all those sorts of different, different systems and different criteria for the people that they're covering. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily uh, harder because of the fragmented system. I think what is more difficult is uh, creating a national view, which would be greatly facilitated by uh, a national insurer um, compared to what we have now, which are in many cases, large insurers with large data sets, but for their own insured population. And I think some of the challenges one might see with uh, the different payer systems is that from a research standpoint, as an example, you get different types of follow-up when you are using data for a Medicare type insurer where you have individuals entering um, uh, due to a benefit uh, that uh, they are now eligible for. They are followed up for a much different time point than uh, you see with individuals who have private insurance and who have the ability or the necessity to change uh, insurers. And then that does impact what you as a researcher can do with the data. Uh, but you are still able to, for many of the products that are out there with claims data, generate uh, analyses that generalize to a large number of people. Okay. 
Amy, you had thoughts I was on that? Uh, to, to follow on that, though, and, and I, I think what, what you've just heard is, is exactly right. There are many contexts in the United States that we can do this work well. However, the ex-U.S. examples within the context of COVID have taught us a lot. So the Israeli example of being able to leverage their electronic health record system to understand the effectiveness of vaccines is a really great example of what can be done when we are able to um, analyze data from large populations through one EHR that's cloud-based. And then the example of a recovery trial conducted in the UK that gave us um, data around dexamethasone is the example of what can happen when you have a national health system and the availability of physicians doing work together in a single system and also leveraging data across those systems. What you're gonna see in the US in the next couple of years in our kind of looking forward conversation we're in today is a number of research groups, industry groups and health tech companies try and mimic those capabilities by now figuring out what's it gonna take in the United States to pull that off even though our system looks different. Okay. Um, so another question for you, Amy, kind of a big picture question, you know, if, if kind of the standards for, um, or the ways that, that indications get approval are changing from, from, you know, from more, like, more likely than not to be randomized controlled trials to a mixture of randomized controlled trials and real world evidence based. Will the physician community, you know, trust and accept those changes? Um, and is there a generational divide there? Are younger doctors gonna be more likely, I'm just guessing here, younger doctors be more likely to to trust the data and older ones maybe more you know, only want to hear things from randomized controlled trials? Oh, this is you know an, an important question to which I don't have a crystal ball. I can just give you my sense um, from my own personal experience and what I've seen across the space. I, I think that there is going to be an important element here to bring the physician community along with the regulatory community um, and the industry community, as well as tech. And, and that's gonna happen um, really through continued socialization, making sure the physicians are at the table and be, are able to say what they trust. And, and also, um, frankly, increased experience um, with uh, different types of, of evidence and data sets and, and having that um, you know, really be used in physician hands. I think you asked though an interesting question, which is that is some of this going to be, you know, a part of a generational um, shift? And I think the answer is probably yes. You know, as I think about my um, fellows um, in when from my time when I practiced as an oncologist at Duke, right? There's those who are digital natives who understand how to trust certain data sets and not trust others. And you're gonna see that happen as sort of a natural part of the understanding of what's possible, especially in younger generations. Um, but I think it's gonna take us a while. We need to make sure we bring the, the physician community along with us. And with that, uh, Dr. Amy Abernethy and Dr. Barry Anakwa, wanna thank you both very much for taking the time, uh, particularly Dr. Abernethy for taking time from your family vacation to come talk with our our, our listeners and journalists today.